Hello and welcome to episode 26 of Linux After Dark. I'm Joe. I'm Chris. I'm Gary. And I'm Dalton. Welcome back, chaps. So today, I want to ask you a bit of a deep one. Where do you draw the line when it comes to your ethics and your ability to put food on the table when it comes to your IT career? I was thinking about this today when I was running my residential IT support business. So there was a bit of a continuum. One time, a guy phoned my business line and said he had an iMac that needed repairing. So I said, okay, bring it. And I was working out of my flat at the time. I went downstairs and this guy was the dodgiest fucker I've ever met. Like, <laughs> he pulled up, he had an iMac seat belted into the front passenger seat, definitely stolen. Like he'd knocked the bezel off and he was like, how quickly can you turn it around? How quickly can you turn it around so I can sell it? He's blatantly going to take it into computer exchange. And it was just after I'd started the business and I was very naive. So I had to quickly like extricate myself from the situation and sort of say, Oh, no, it looks a bit complex, that one, actually. I don't think I can do it. But other times, for me, it's been interpersonal. Rather than working for like a big, bad corporation, it would be off-color remarks and things like that. So I'd be working for a person and fixing their computer, and they would say something, and I would be like, I'm not comfortable with that, but I need to eat. Mm. <laughs> so I can't, I can't go, that's unacceptable, and leave. Because literally, it's feast or famine sometimes when you're just a sole trader, self-employed. My morals would not trump the need to eat, sadly. But luckily, I have only really, to this point now, you know, the job I do now, I really like because only this week, there was an article about statins research, which has been rumbling on for ages. And I've been answering tickets for the person that was interviewed to do with the study at the university I work at. And we get a twice weekly email with that stuff. So that makes me feel quite good that you can see a kind of beneficial outcome of what I do. So I haven't as yet had to come across a choice, which I think is more where maybe the rest of you might have some examples of, I'm not doing that for that big, bad company or that big, bad proprietary software provider. Well, speaking of the big bad software provider, have you ever tried to find jobs in embedded engineering? Do you have any idea how many people will pay you a lot of money to make guns? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, maybe it's just a US thing, but in my job hunt, I discovered that uh, Ball, you know, the company that makes jars? Yeah, they're in material science for guns too. Oh, Isn't it great? I guess we don't have that here because you can have a, a firearm, but not as easily as <laughs> over there. You've got to have very specific reasons for having one. Well, I mean, I say guns, I mean weapons of all shapes and sizes. You want to make a Linux that runs for a very short period of time in between a missile launching and <laughs> meeting its destination? I'll pay you a lot of money to do that. Presumably an awful lot of money. Oh yeah, a lot of money. But you will never, <laughs> your friends will never hear from you again. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly if you talk about it. I know people who went into that kind of thing and they are, they're gone. They don't exist anymore. Wow. Where I grew up, there was a BAE Systems, which is not there anymore. And a few of my kind of peers at school's parents worked for BAE. And as you grow up, you realize what that actually means. And some of them were doing that kind of work, like literally optimizing how to kill someone very quickly through some kind of embedded guidance system, you know, weapons that kill people. It's incredibly well paid, but I'd like to think I wouldn't want to do that. Right. Everyone's all high and mighty until it comes to not being able to eat anymore. And everyone has a price. That's the problem. I'm saying that now, but then how much is on the table? <laughs> and then do you say no? Yeah, I find it really difficult because I think I would draw the line at something that would cause serious harm and or death to people. But equally, like you say, you know, I need to put food on the table. And growing up in an environment where it sometimes was a problem putting food on the table, you know, I was kind of brought up in the kind of environment where you had to do what was necessary to put food on the table. So I suppose for me, I can be a little bit more idealistic about it now. But yeah, like I say, if you get desperate, everyone has a price. For me, for example, with these shows, what I could do is, I could get automated dynamic ad insertion ads. And what that means is that when you go to download the show, the server 
instantly decides which ad to serve you based on a bunch of just ad tech bullshit and then instantly stitches it in and then your download starts. That happens within a few hundred milliseconds, I think. And that doesn't sit well with me. And I don't think it would sit well with the audience either. The ads that you hear on the various shows are all read by me and that's all bespoke deals done with companies or sometimes agencies, but mostly just companies. And that feels a lot more ethical to me. The fact that I can actually check out those companies, see what they have to offer. And there's no tracking as such. Like the, the only tracking is what country you're in and the number of downloads per country, basically. That's as, as fine as the tracking that goes on on any of these shows. And yet the industry is really going in that direction of these dynamically inserted ads. I mean, what do you lot think of those? You lot listen to podcasts. You must have heard them. No, I mostly skip them. No one skips ads, though. No one ever skips ads. <laughs> <laughs> right. But before you skip them, you do know what they are. Well, yeah, because usually it'll be a change of background music or the voice changes significantly. There's one podcast that I've been listening to where someone literally phoned in all of the ads. <laughs> like you could tell it's over shitty eight kilohertz mono audio. It's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Just as quickly as possible in one take. <laughs> uh -huh. So yeah, I, I definitely get that. And um, don't phone your ads in, Joe. Keep using the microphone, please. <laughs> I'll try. But the temptation is there to do those deals with the companies who offer the dynamic ones. But I just, it's not so much the fact that it's dynamically inserted. It's much more about how they decide what those ads are. That crosses a line for me into proper ad tech. And I just don't like ad tech. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's where it crosses a line for me is the way that they gather the data for their ad tech and ad targeting. I don't like the fact that they're using everything I do online in order to just sell me stuff. So I would much rather, you know, the way you do it now, where you find people who are going to sell ads on the shows that are actually relevant to your listeners and you vet them. And, you know, you're probably not going to hear an ad for BAE on this podcast, right? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Depends how much they're paying. Okay, this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to know exactly what happens between launch and destination of your bombs? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't say no to something cool that was not Linux related or IT related, for example. Like, uh, I'm not going to say the name of it because I really want them to, uh, well, send me a free one. But there's like a wallet company that's got a, a quite expensive, fancy wallets, but uh, modern tech. It's Ridge Wallet, all right? <laughs> it's Ridge Wallet. But they have RFID uh, isolated bits. Yeah, look, we're not doing the bloody no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, I wouldn't mind doing that, for example. You know, that's a premium product and fair enough, not everyone can afford it, but you know, that's totally fine. But again, aspects of that product are relevant to your audience. Like their target market is probably men in their late 20s, early 30s who are interested in technology, right? Not to stereotype or listenership or anything. Well, from meetups and stuff, that appears to be the demographic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone has a daily carry in our demographic. So if it was a backpack or, or anything like that, mm. My wife laughs at me at how long I spend agonizing over a backpack, but I'm like, it has to have a padded laptop pocket. It has to have like separate other pockets. It needs, to, if I put a water bottle in, I need to know it's not going to leak, all of that stuff. Cause I carry loads of technology with me in the backpack. So yeah, it's definitely like relevant. Um, I, I, I am doing an ad read. Now. <laughs> um, yeah. And so uh, the LNL backpack is, is coming out next week. <laughs> well, Chris, all I can say is okay, this episode is sponsored by Mountain Warehouse. That's where I get mine from. I, I don't know why we're doing all these free ads for people, but yeah, if you're in the UK, Mountain Warehouse, it rules. <laughs> when we think about Google, uBlock Origin and uh, AdGuard this week have released their first attempts at manifest v3 extensions for the chromium based browsers because google seemed to be pulling the land back and saying that they want to restrict ad blocking in chromium based browsers and i feel like maybe that's starting to come back so it's possibly going to become more prevalent these dynamic inserted ads and that kind of thing so the way i look at it is if it means the podcast carries on, it's hard, isn't it? 
do you get to a point where it's that or you struggle to put food on the table, whether it's to keep the podcast going or to keep your business going in my case. It's like Dalton said at the beginning of this the discussion, context is also part of it. I think, you know, if you're looking for sponsorship and the market has shifted in that direction and people are less inclined to offer you anything else, it starts to become a, a difficult conversation, doesn't it? It's interesting that this went straight for ads, uh, as these discussions tend to do. Does it basically wrap up with either you die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain? Well, I, I don't know. I, I just It is really funny when you think back to the beginnings of the internet and Google being the don't be evil company and how quickly, you know, I think I found the other day, I put it in the Telegram group, there was a very early snapshot of early Google, the Google homepage, where it was like, we will never sell ads, something really bold and brazen like that. Mm. And then it's become the bedrock of so much of like the big players in the internet. So I think it's inevitable. But something I wanted to ask you all about is vendor lock-in. Now, Chris, when you were doing your IT business, that must have been something you thought about, about not locking people into services and trying to educate them a little bit about the reality of putting all of your data into Google Drive, let's say, or Dropbox or iCloud or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, that was really difficult because if we take Apple as an example, you know, I'm not Lewis Rossman, so quite a lot of my clients had Apple products and I would have to have the conversation with them where they would be like, can you help me with this? And I'd be like, well, I can help you with the software side of things and kind of your workflow and chaining these devices together. You know, often it would be, it's a jigsaw puzzle that I don't know how to put together, but this is the jigsaw puzzle. You can't change the bits. And I would say to them, you know, you can't come to me and say it's broken. Can you fix it? And if you want that, I'm going to have to refer you. There are a couple of people that can help with that kind of thing outside of Apple. But as many people have discussed before, that's what's hard is people actually sometimes like vendor lock-in and call it an ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, I had over the years, only four or five people that I installed Linux for and they stuck with it, which I still think is quite impressive, to be honest. A few of them would just come to me and, and ask, but things like with the cloud, I did have this woman come to me once and she said, I'm fed up with Google and I want to get all my photos back. And I did it for her and she paid me a, a reasonable amount of money. I used a Python script, which you can get on GitHub, where you pull the photos down and the metadata is in separate JSON files. And then the script tries to combine them as best as possible back into the EXIF. But they're not organized in like folders and a directory structure and a file system because Google never wanted you to get them back. And she was like, why are they like this? And I said, well, that's the best I can do. You now have to not do that anymore. And she really struggled with the idea of I said, you should really be backing up locally and backing up in more than one place. And you need to design how this works. People like that stuff. They, they like someone else to go, we'll just do it all for you. See, I think it's difficult because no matter what you do, whether it's you know, in the personal world or in the enterprise world, you're always going to be somewhat locked into something, right? So I use Nextcloud to back up my photos from my phone. And that's the solution that I now use, my wife now uses, even my parents use. So I've sort of locked myself into running a Nextcloud server without a ton of hassle to have to go and re-architect the backup of my photos you know, for a load of other stuff. In the same way that on my servers, you know, I've written all of my infrastructure as code and my Ansible and Terraform and stuff to run on Ubuntu. And there is a bunch of re-architecting there if I'm to architect my way out of using Ubuntu. So I'm locked into that. So even though both of those products are open source, free software, quite unquote, I'm locked into them really because there's a ton of work and it's just not practical for me to move out of that in the same way that you know, it's probably not practical that I'm going to cancel my iCloud subscription anytime soon because I've got 10 years worth of photos in there at this point. You just reminded me just briefly of the recent Plex outage. I had the same thing. Plex, 
had a password leak. And so they basically de-authed everyone and made them reset their password and said, check the box to sign out. Now, the problem is that their auth server got hammered so badly, you couldn't reassociate your Plex server, which has to be done via their servers in the cloud, if you're going to stream remotely, for like 24 to 48 hours. Now, I can spin up Genifim for myself, but I can't really... I mean, I could, but it would take longer than was worth. Get all of those people, like you mentioned, Gary, with Nextcloud that use Plex to install the Jellyfin app, make sure it's set up, make sure it's associated with the Jellyfin instance and everything without geographically going to all those places. So it's the same thing. I just waited it out. And I don't like the fact that there is this cloud backend that it's beholden to, but they know how it works and they're used to it to get them onto something else. It's similar, but it's not the same, not enough the same. It's fine for us, but lots of people don't like anything to change at all, <laughs> at all. So that change is just, you know, being an adult and accepting that the world changes. But at the same time, how much time, how much money are you going to spend on a solution that doesn't actually work for people? Well, do let us know where you draw the line. You can email us show at linuxafterdark.net. But with that, we'd better get out of here. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Chris. I've been Gary. I'm still conflicted. <laughs> See you later. <laughs>